Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Welcome to the 8th in a series of Redux Reviews, where I revisit my earlier videos that were recorded a few years ago on substandard equipment with less in the way of production values. The aim of these reviews is to enable me to tighten and expand the writing, fleshing it out with further insights where appropriate, and to produce something of superior video and audio quality to the original. Today's review is 2016's Need to Know and Handler's Screen for Delta Green the Role Playing Game by Arc Dream Publishing. This was literally the third video I ever made for my channel, and upon retrospect, I feel I should have gone into the starter scenario, Last Things Last, as I have since learned from many players that this was the first exposure they had to the grim world of Delta Green. Additionally, I think enough time has passed now to safely say that it isn't new anymore, so spoilers wouldn't necessarily be considered red hot for this product. Okay, first a bit of history. Originally released in 2016 for the then brand new Delta Green the Role Playing Game, Need to Know is an any award winning starter rule set and scenario book that is available as a 48 page softback and a pay what you want PDF. The handler screen was included for the print version. To the cover. Here we have a really good piece by Dennis Tatwiller. I originally said that I would have preferred this to have been the cover of the Agent Handbook, as it gives hints of cosmic horror lurking in the unconsciousness of another doomed agent, and despite now actually understanding the cover of the Agent's Handbook, I still stand by what I said, as I simply think it's a better piece. Ok, let's have a look at the handler screen before taking a look at the book itself. It is a four panel, incredibly solidly constructed screen that seems to divide fans. I personally love the look of the art, and especially like the fact that you can make out almost every palette knife and brush mark. Information wise, it's as up to date as the original rules, though there have been errata since and I'm not sure how this would affect what is presented. As Need to Know contains an abbreviated set of rules that are just enough for you to get started, I'll skim over what is contained as I've covered the ins and outs of the system in plenty of other videos. Right to the inside. After we get past the now expected array of all kinds of creepy documentation, open gaming license, and content page, we move to Welcome to Delta Green. Here it explains the usual what is a role playing game, as well as what a handler and operation are, and the results of their investigations. It gives us a page on what you need to play Delta Green, you know, dice, and then a shift to how to be a player. It makes the point of stressing things like respect the mood, where it explains the need to know when to laugh, and even trusting the handler, as you're all here for the same reason, alongside other more obvious things like working with the other players, speaking for your agent, describing your agent's actions, and responding quickly in order to keep the game moving. It then gives us a page of hints on how to be the handler. All good points like maintaining the mood, presenting a vivid world, portraying interesting characters, and interpreting the rules fairly. To be honest, this advice would be good for any role playing game, and could easily be applied across the board. This is followed by an example of play featuring two agents, which again is pretty good. The next chapter is entitled, What is an Agent? Here it goes into how to build an agent to play in game. It goes through all of the things you need to fill in on a character sheet, as well as going into a little detail on things like bonds, motivations and mental disorders, sand loss and skills, as well as giving us a broad guide on what a percentage in a skill relates to in regard to a level of expertise. This is followed by a character sheet, and then it continues with more game-centric stuff like wounds, ailments, armour and gear, weapons, and even things like developments that affect your home and family life. It then goes into creating an agent. Starting with choosing a profession, it moves through stat arrays and derived attributes, and then it goes on to bonds, giving some basic information on numbers and examples. It touches on defining your character's motivations, and then moves on to how to determine your professional skills. We get a few good examples of careers for agents such as computer scientists, federal agents, physicians and special ops, and it also includes a table called What Brought You to Delta Green, which details the traumatic background, the raise in occult skill, the sand loss, and notes on other things that are gained. This is followed by six simple pre-calculated characters. So, after that we move on to the game system. We get a step-by-step -step guide on when to ask for a role, opposed roles and simple pursuit rules, luck and bonuses and penalties. It then goes into the rules for combat, giving a list of the actions that can be taken, defence roles and also damage, including lethality, kill radiuses, armour, cover and some sample damage rolls. We have a page on Sanity which gives the sand loss for a smorgasbord of different events, and then we move on to Insanity itself, which goes into Temporary Insanity, Disorders, including some examples, and Permanent Insanity. It then gives a page on Preserving Sanity, including the Delta Green-centric Adaptation Rules, the rules on repressing symptoms of insanity and regaining sanity. We have an overview on Willpower and what it's used for, as well as a light touch on Bonds and a good summary of the home phase. 
Okay, so now we move on to the bundled scenario, last things last. There'll be spoilers from this point onwards, so stop watching now if you intend to play this. Last Things Last is a starter Delta Green operation intended for 1-5 to five players. It examines the case of Clyde Bauman, a Delta Green operative that was active between 1967 and 1970, and occasionally a friendly in the late 1990s. Four days ago, he died of a heart attack at home, and agents nearby have been activated in order to sweep his apartment to remove any evidence linking him to Delta Green. In life, he generally kept his secrets, with one exception. When his wife Marlene died in 2002, he tried using incantations discovered during his association with Delta Green to bring her back to life, except it went horribly wrong. Instead of restoring her to life, it created a monster that spoke with his dead wife's voice. Horrified at what he had done, he sealed the creature that was his wife in a septic tank at an isolated cabin that he owned. He just couldn't bring himself to destroy the monster, and she still waits there. It gives us a little information about involving the agents, explaining the difference between the programme and the outlaws without explicitly naming them, and stressing that the players should decide which they want to be part of. So at this point, whichever Delta Green they're involved with has activated them based on availability and proximity in order to get them to Bauman's apartment. Those agents who are government employees in the official Delta Green find themselves suddenly assigned to a joint terrorism task force with a complete ban on what their supervisors can ask them about it. They have plane tickets reserved and are to gather at 2pm in a conference room in the city that Bauman lives in. Obviously there is no task force, just the operation. Non-government Delta Green agents are contacted by a control officer, telling them to meet at a particular time and place in an innocuous but secret way, an encrypted email or a wrong number. They have to make their own excuses and arrangements and journey to their meeting with their control officer at the post office HQ in Bauman City, wherever that may be. The control officer acts as a go-between for the agents with Delta Green and provides logistical support but never joins their operation. They are to go to Bauman's apartment, remove any Delta Green evidence, involve nobody else, report any signs that Bauman breached Delta Green protocol and meet up back where they currently are in 48 hours, just before Bauman's heirs arrive. Next we move on to Bauman's apartment. It is an inconspicuous affair in a working class neighbourhood on the decline with blocky 1960s design. The agents are ignored if they're cautious to a reasonable extent, and there are no security cameras about. The inside of the apartment is stained by cigarette smoke and grim, not even looking like anybody ever lived there. There's a ring of keys inside the door that includes one for his cabin. A couch faces an old television, and there is a stack of completed crossword books, Reader's Digests and Sports Illustrated, alongside a box of bad donuts that are now crumbling to dust. The kitchen is an equally sad affair, with a drawing of a human figure entitled Grandpa, and signed by Cassie being the only human touch. It has a bathroom of no interest other than the slight smell of death, as this is where he passed away. It has two bedrooms, of which one is occupied with a queen-size bed and a dresser that has photographs of Clyde with his wife Marlene, high school graduation photos of his children and photos of his grandchild. There is no computer here, though there is a stack of papers that, when investigated, can reveal that he owned a cabin about four hours' drive away. The complication here is Mrs Janowitz, a 66-year-old neighbour who is out walking her dog, who will tell the agents that it's sad Mr Bauman wasn't found for three days, though she can easily be persuaded by any convincing story. So, assuming the players have discovered its existence, the cabin is next. As previously mentioned, it is a few hours' drive and not difficult to reach, with the last few miles being off-road. It has a bedroom, bathroom, living room, a few closets and a kitchen. It's built from wood with a faux log cabin exterior, heated by a large stone chimney, and has water and electricity. It's clear by the cobwebs that nobody has been here for a few months. Inspecting it will note two items of interest, a footlocker and the plumbing. Outside the cabin, there is an outhouse and shed. A forensic roll can determine that the outhouse hasn't been used for a few months. The shed contains some tools and 20 full one-gallon cans of gasoline. Around 30 foot from the edge of the cabin there is a hatch for a septic tank that is not buried as you might expect and it's clear that this has been the case for years. Also it is padlocked shut. Further investigation will reveal that there are in fact two hatches with one buried and that it is way too big for a cabin of this size. Bauman's Vietnam era metal footlocker is stowed under the bed. This is where he kept mementos of his time with Delta Green. On top of the contents is a sealed envelope with a green triangle on it. It contains Clyde Bauman's final words and confession when he tells the reader to pour the gasoline into the septic tank, light it and walk away without looking. The contents of the footlocker are intended as clues or hooks for future missions or even help to complete ongoing ones. It contains the following. 
a set of reel-to-reel tapes that are labelled 15th of August 72 to 29th of September 72 that are 21 hours in length. It sounds like a congregation of pseudo-Christian services where Saint Yig and the Sealed Redeemer and the Blessed Serpent are all mentioned. People can be heard crying out after being bitten and refused medical treatment. This will cause a minor sand hit. There's a cardboard box containing a neatly folded suit covered in blood. There's an annotated copy of a doctoral dissertation called Sky Devils, Archetypal Figures in Native American Mythology by someone called Karen Barr, which was rejected by the University of Indiana in 1985. Studying it lowers Sam but raises the unnatural skill. There are three 20-year-old tear gas grenades that require a luck roll to work. There is a large iron knife of Anglo-Saxon manufacture that has strange markings that can't be deciphered. The handle, made of human bone, seems to be new. There's a leather pouch containing black bear hair, human infant teeth and blue jay and barn swallow feathers. There's a highly magnetised sphere of glass that can cause a sand hit. And finally, a sizeable file about the Ventaja Corporation, an Argentinian import-export firm from 1965 to 1968. If the agents read it, they can find that the file shows the FBI investigated them with regard to weapon smuggling in Miami, but that was fruitless. Delta Green continued to watch the company, and Bauman uncovered financial ties with the company and accounts detailed on a World War II era watch list called K Group. It details that a raid on a Ventaja warehouse in Puerto Rico recovered something called the Shield Formula. A folder with that title is empty. So, moving on from the footlocker, if the agents look at the plumbing, they can find that none of the pipes lead to the septic tank. It's clear that they once did, but have been disconnected. This may appear as odd to the players. Should anyone listen to the tank, it is silent, but if it is opened, the horror within will be revealed. It is two metres deep and wide, dark and slightly damp due to a layer of water on the bottom. The interior ladder has been removed. Anyone shining a light inside will attract the attention of Clyde's grotesquely reanimated wife, Marlene. At this point, she is a wasted corpse, rotten due to years spent in the septic tank, seeing her as a sand hit. She's ended up this way due to Bauman imbuing her with an unnatural consciousness called the Other. The Other is an extra-dimensional intelligence that can inhabit a human corpse. What is left is unnaturally quick and strong and more cunning than intelligent. It knows a lot of what Marlene knew, though it couldn't convince Clyde that his wife had returned. It made it unthinkable to destroy her as it spoke with his dead wife's voice. It will try to manipulate newcomers by pounding on the inside of the tank and crying in a sad, croaky voice for help. She would tell the agents that her husband was a sick man who saw terrible secrets and that he used some sort of pagan prayer to enslave her and keep her from dying. She would tell them that when Clyde realised it hadn't worked, he locked her up in this tank and would beg for air, light and freedom. To all appearances, she will look like a misshapen woman in her fifties, though her skin is grey-blue and she's ripped out most of her hair. Her hands are blood-stained with the flesh stripped from them from clawing at the walls. Her legs are bloated with immersion in the water, with the skin sloughing off, and yet she is alive. She will try her best to persuade the agents to help her, but depending on the human score of those examining her, they can figure out that she is neither as vulnerable as she seems, and that there is a strange disconnect between her speech and her mannerisms. If the agents deny Marlene any help, the other will try bargaining with them, promising them the secrets of the cosmos for its freedom. What it knows, or indeed if it knows anything, is up to the handler, though it is suggested that about three quarters of what it says is nonsense. Anyone who talks to it for a few hours can add plus one to their natural skill and lose one sand. Marlene can be kept captive and visited on numerous occasions, but that may make the agent a threat to Delta Green itself. It then moves on to destroying Marlene. It suggests that this shouldn't be easy as the agents should be informed that they will take a sand loss for violence if they proceed. If the agents believe her to be telling the truth, this is a bigger loss. The option to do so is provided by Clyde, the gasoline in the shed. If they proceed to pouring it in, she will scream in panic and beg for mercy. If they carry on, it will leap from the septic tank and attack the agent holding the gasoline. If they block the entrance, it will try to muscle its way out. Alternatively, if the agents try to bring her out of the septic tank and attempt to kill her, she will lash out with lightning speed and ferocity. She'll only fight for a few turns before making a break for the woods in order to find a corpse in better condition to animate. If they manage to restrain her, the screaming and death throes will be horrific and live long in the memory of the agents that take her down. If they destroy Marlene after she attacks them, they all gain D8 San. Finally, we have the conclusion which details how or if the agents hand back Clyde Barman's collection to Delta Green, also suggesting a home scene for those who come back hurt or insane. 
Lastly, we have the stats for that which was Marlene and the two-player handouts of Clyde's profile and the note left for those that discovered the cabin. In my original review almost five years ago, I mentioned that the handler screen was the best I had ever seen, and that stands to this day, with only the RuneQuest Garantha one coming close since. I also said that it was a solid, if fairly light on the ground product, something I still believe to hold true. There's literally all you need to know to play the game contained within, and you could probably play Delta Green for a good while before feeling the need to purchase the Agent's Handbook, the Handler's Guide, or any of the scenarios if you wrote your own. This light approach was absolutely by design, as other than the contained scenario, nothing about the world of Delta Green beyond what an agent would ordinarily know is detailed here. There's a condensed rule set that works, which is an uncommon thing. Additionally, with it being pay what you want, there's no reason whatsoever to skip this beyond time and getting a group together to play it. Everything you need to kick it all off is contained within. The included scenario, Last Things Last, has become a staple when showing new players Delta Green, and there are some fairly good reasons for that. Firstly, it's quite short, essentially only having a few important scenes. It gives you a taste of what is to come with the bizarre contents of the Foot Locker, something that the other Delta Green scenarios have included to great effect, and it demonstrates the hopeless fight that Delta Green continues to do. Clyde Bowman saved Delta Green, possibly protecting untold numbers of souls, and yet he died alone in the bathroom undiscovered for days. He had the joy of his life, Marlene, twisted beyond recognition by the selfishness of his actions, and ultimately paid a dear price with the twisted and terrifying horror that she became. I also see the cleaning up of Bauman's house as an almost symbolic passing of the torch from the old Chaosium Call of Cthulhu Delta Green to the new Arc Dream publishing version, which feels poignant in a sense. Need to Know remains a smart, cleverly put together piece of game writing that proves that flashy box sets and custom dice are no substitute for something that is cleverly thought out, well laid out, has nice art and excellent writing throughout. I originally gave Need to Know a 9 out of 10, which is a score I continue to stand by. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I'll put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon or even becoming a member of my YouTube channel. But out.